Here's an idea. Both the world and history may have ended. But that doesn't mean they can't start back up again. Things are tense. It's tough to deny that right now the world can feel a bit like a standoffish middle school dance with nukes. Foreign policy, geopolitics, international defense, even long-standing institutions like the European Union, and depending upon who you ask, democracy itself have uncertain futures. Rather than indulging our inner chicken little, it may be useful to know that this isn't, of course, the first time some people have felt like the end is nigh. As a matter of fact, depending upon who you ask, and we will ask, it's possible that either the world or history has already ended. Though at the end of both of those things and this episode, maybe we can find a beginning. But to begin, begin, first, we're gonna ask about history. In the late 20th century, two theorists, Francis Fukuyama and Le Grand Grouch, the late Jean Baudrillard, posited that if history had not already ended, it soon might. Fukuyama's most famous piece, a short essay from 1989, is proto-clickbait, titled simply, the end of history? At the end of the Cold War, Fukuyama saw that with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had reached the total exhaustion of viable systematic alternatives to Western liberalism. Basically, with communism done for, it seemed that the world had decided how societies should be run, and the answer was liberal democracy. You get a liberal democracy, and you get a liberal democracy, and your liberal democracy includes such hits as consent of the governed, separation of powers, rule of law, voter rights, and many more. And okay, fair, not everywhere had or has liberal democracy, but Fukuyama felt that it seemed likely everywhere eventually would. And importantly, it also seemed that wherever Western liberal democracy went, Western consumer culture followed. And these facts would be sufficient to deem history over. But okay, that was 1989, it's 2017, and stuff is still happening, so what gives? Well, Fukuyama and others who've talked about the potential end of history, people like Moore, Hegel, and Marx, consider history to be the gradual political, ideological, and cultural progression of humans, not the literal occurrence of events. Fukuyama says history ends when societal problems are no longer solved by switching to an alternative political economic system. The one you have may not be perfect, but switching to another isn't gonna make things better. In 1989, Fukuyama perceived that the only true challenges to Western liberal democracy came from communism and fascism, and the world decided that those weren't great. So, no alternative political economic systems to be had. Essentially, in the marketplace of ideas, it seemed like Western liberal democracy won, and as it and its capitalist consumer-oriented culture spreads across the globe, then political, ideological, and cultural progression would cease, thus ending history. Of course, it may feel right now like democracy's global victory is less sure, and Fukuyama agrees. We're gonna talk more about that later. An ended history would be a very sad time, Fukuyama wrote. The worldwide ideological struggle that called forth daring courage, imagination, and idealism will be replaced by economic calculation, the endless solving of technical problems, environmental concerns, and the satisfaction of sophisticated consumer demands. I'll leave you to decide whether or not that resembles our current state of affairs. Now, never content with leaving things only half bleak, Jean Baudrillard argued, why stop there? In his 1997 article titled The End of the Millennium or The Countdown, he takes Fukuyama's ending as a beginning. Baudrillard doesn't see the end of history as a grand finale to our shared past. He sees it as a collapse of reality itself almost. Like Fukuyama, Baudrillard considers the fall of the Berlin Wall significant. He calls it the last great historic event. But it doesn't mark an arrival. Instead, it signals a moment where history folds in on itself, where we no longer occupy some ever-progressing present, but instead we're stuck in both the past and the future. I know, right? There's a reason they quote Baudrillard in The Matrix. We're stuck in the past because we won't let it go. Baudrillard says we're always looking back, trying to relive what once was. The past is always around as a clone of itself, an artificial double, he says, frozen in a sham exactitude. Shh, don't tell him they're making another Blade Runner. And we're stuck in the future, apparently, because we're preoccupied by predictions and countdowns. Baudrillard says that the year 2000 wouldn't happen, which clearly it did. But really, what he means is that with the end of the century in sight, it's almost like the century already ended. Leading up to 2000, we obsessively counted down to it, and in this view, made it happen before it actually happened. 
It's sort of like when you're waiting for the bus and you look down the street hoping to see it. Once it appears on the horizon, you're done waiting, even if the bus isn't actually at your stop. When you count the seconds separating you from the end, Baudrillard writes, the fact is that everything is already at an end. We are already beyond the end. With all these countdowns and all this information and media just flying around, Baudrillard says that no single event ever has a chance to be. We anticipate events as one possibility amongst many, and when they happen, we experience them mostly as media images, emptied of reality. These events, or really their images, instantaneously become history for us to fawn over and we then move on to the next prediction. Events age so rapidly, they're born before they exist and they die before they've lived, which is possibly the most brutal thing I've ever said on Idea Channel. Baudrillard was sort of a technological alarmist, but ironically, his dismal thesis can be summed up by everyone's favorite equine simulacrum horse ebooks, who in June 2012 tweeted, everything happens so much. JB might agree, clarifying that everything happens so much, it's like everything's not happening, and then history ends, I guess. But again, why stop there? In his 2013 book, Hyper Objects, philosopher Timothy Morton proposed that it is not history which has ended, quite the opposite, in fact, but rather the world itself. In keeping with our current theme of stuff not being what it is, Morton isn't saying the actual planet has been death starred and we're actually vat brains stirred by alien scientists, CF our No Man's Sky episode. Rather, Morton says that the world isn't a place or a thing, but quote, a fragile aesthetic effect. It's like a, a set of feelings and appearances that are less true and more useful. Useful politically, rhetorically, spiritually, narratively, for stories, pleas, petitions, and politics. The world, he argues, never really existed beyond us wanting to use that word for some unclear thing bigger than ourselves. And some stuff has gone down that has literally ended it. The world. Just not literally the rock we're on. That's Earth. That's still here. For now. Cool, this is getting murky. Maybe we should take a break. Oh God. Okay, so since once is never enough, Morton says that the world has actually ended three times. First, in April of 1784, when John Watt invented the steam engine, again in 1945, when the Manhattan Project tested Gadget, the first atom bomb, and again that same year, when nuclear bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Each of these events literally destroys a part of the Earth, but also destroy the idea that the world is bigger than us, beyond our impact. It's not. Each of these events increasingly shows human action to be, quote, a geophysical force. What the thoughts of Fukuyama and Baudrillard only imply, Morton is trying to make more explicit. That people tend mostly to focus on people. History ends when people stop progressing ideologically, when people become preoccupied with countdowns. But for Morton, it's critical to understand that there's more to history than just people, and to explain why he makes reference to a concept called the Anthropocene. Mr. Dr. Joe Hansen over at It's Okay to Be Smart did an episode on this, but the long and short of it is that on the geological timescale you have epochs, or epochs, massively drawn out lengths of geological progression. There was the Pliocene, the Pleistocene, the Holocene, and now we've arguably entered the Anthropocene, the epoch of people. Previous geological epochs were defined by, say, continental drift or a great ice age. The Anthropocene is defined by us. Morton says our geological impact started with the coal deposits from steam engines, continued with nuclear devastation, and is settling now on the disastrous effects of global warming, which shapes economics, politics, and small talk about the weather. By destroying parts of the planet, we've effectively destroyed the aesthetic idea of the world as something separate from us. But neither have we discovered that we alone are the world. We aren't the sole influencers of our giant sky rock. As evidenced by the current global ecological disaster, we would certainly reverse if we could. We are subject to it as much as it is subject to us. So then, what are we left with at the end of the world? In the Anthropocene, Morton says we may find the beginning of history, conveniently, one which is no longer exclusively human, he writes. This new history, unlike Fukuyama and Baudrillard's, isn't about progress, but intimacy between ourselves and the non-human. We're forced to recognize that while we may have made the world, we are only tenants of the earth and can begin a history of awareness and urgency 
or else after losing the world and possibly restarting history, we may still just lose the planet. It turns out that after all these years, Fukuyama himself is also thinking about the beginning of history. He recently admitted that in the end of history, he didn't account for democracy as a whole going into decline. History may have ended in 1989 only to start back up again in 2017, as we confront the increasingly uncertain primacy of Western liberalism. And just to round this all out, what does Baudrillard say? Well, he died in 2007, but much of his work, his attitude towards the state of the world, it can be summed up in one pithy observation. What do y'all think? Is history over? Did it end and then start again, given the parameters that Fukuyama and Baudrillard talked about? Did, did the world end? Is the world over, given what Morton was talking about? Let us know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. There is no comment response video this week and we are gonna be taking the next two weeks off, but there are some consolation prizes. First, in case you missed it, Crash Course Mythology, which I am hosting, got started last week. So if you wanna check out the first episode of that, we'll put a link in the description. It attempts to answer the question, what is myth? And second, we have a Patreon, and on that Patreon over the next couple weeks, we're gonna be posting some behind the scenes stuff, some photos, uh, some, some desktops, maybe some, maybe some bloopers videos, if we can find some things that I don't look at and get immediately dreadfully embarrassed by. We also have a Facebook, an IRC, and a subreddit, and the tweet of the week comes from Manu V and everyone else who pointed me towards the most recent Lasagna Cat video, which I'm just not gonna bother trying to explain what it is. I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna leave your future in your own hands. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these post-historians.